thanks for the opportunity to speak and kind of go a little bit of this. So I, I joked Audiograms and Beyond, and then I talked with Kristen. It, literally, I threw this title together because I honestly did not know what to call this talk. So when I was talking with Kristen yeah. Steenerson about it, she said I absolutely had to throw a Buzz Lightyear reference in. <laughs> you know, so I'm going to say we are falling with style here. Oh, that's cool. you know? that's cool. So with that, let me, let me I, I think um, it's funny because I get, every time I get asked to give one of these, you know, the question is, oh, well, can you just talk? Put up some audiograms and throw up some interesting cases or something like that. And, and so on one hand, that's a good thing. And on the other hand, I kind of feel like it almost sells a little bit short some of the things we do and some of what um, I think learning opportunities for particularly for our residents and fellows in the room. So with that, let me give you a brief overview of what I want to cover here. So I'm only going to cover two cases, um, but I'm going to go into a lot of depth on, on these as to kind of why, because um, I think they can really exemplify things that we can do go, that go beyond just simple assessment of hearing status, which of course I know that's what most of you guys need for your medical purposes, but there's a lot of things we do to go beyond that. In some cases, um, really can influence your medical management of a given patient. Um, and when I do these deep dives, I'm going to really try to focus on the why and the how, so that you guys have a better understanding of kind of where some of these decisions actually came from. So with that thought in mind, let's just get right to the meat of the thing here. So this is, um, we'll pull um, uh, Lawrence Olivier from Hamlet, you know, so to re-implant or to not re-implant for this patient? And that's the question of the day here. So this is somebody, of course, you know, at Stanford, we get, we're the cleanup crew, we get a lot of uh, referrals from outside spots. So this was a 60-year-old woman who was uh, sent to Nick. Uh, you know, classic, um, you know, she has worn hearing aids for 30 years. Um, she received a, a right, um, a hybrid implant in her right side, so the L24, okay? So this is the longer of the hybrid arrays, but this isn't the uh, necessarily full-size electrode array. Um, to be honest, she didn't like it very much, okay? She had very slow progress, didn't like the sound quality. She said things very much sounded kind of like um, Alvin and the Chipmunks, really kind of high-pitched sort of thing, okay? And so after a couple of years, then she was seen to... Um, had come in to see us regarding a, well, actually looking at candidacy on her left side because she's still having a lot of trouble communicating even after implantation, you know, and so I kind of wanted to see, like, well, what do we do at this point? So, okay, so, of course, we start the audiogram, right? This is the first thing we immediately think of. So what does the hearing look like once we're look without uh, the implant at all? As you can see, it's consistent with the use of the hybrid device. I guess, I don't know, we don't really have a laser pointer, but, you know, we've got... We did preserve, uh, some low frequency hearing was preserved in the ear that's planted. And the left ear, of course, and we have a little more uh, residual low frequency hearing, as well as hearing it through some of the mid frequencies as well. Okay. But certainly hearing is not good on that side. I'm sorry, Kristen, you missed your Buzz Lightyear reference, and I had one in there for you. Thank you. I know, I know. <laughs> All right, so she's still using the hearing it on that left side. Okay. She's having trouble communicating, though. So, of course, then the question is, what does she do with her devices? You know, how well is she functioning there? And can we use that as a guide as to how to handle this patient? Okay. So what I'm showing you here, the, the, the A's represent aided thresholds. Okay. So this is what she's picking up with her implant on with the right side and with her hearing aid with the left side. Okay. Uh, just a reminder, the hybrid device, you know, this is the one where it's designed to where you can use a hearing aid in the same ear that you use the implant. So if you preserve that hearing in the low frequencies, we can combine a hearing aid and implant on the <coughs> same side, okay? And I'll tell you, she wasn't really using it, all right? She didn't, didn't really, they told her, well, I don't know if you're going to get much out of it in the previous place she was at. So she wasn't using the acoustic component. Um, so you can see, you know, her performance in quiet is, is reasonably good for an implant user at 64%. You put some background noise in that she bottoms out in a hurry, okay? And on the, her left ear, the ear with the hearing aid again, she's scoring pretty similarly, where, again, not well, but she's not exactly the best implant candidate in the world. Um, and more important, you know, of course, when we get to, like, how do we actually manage this patient? And what do we think about when we get these sort of borderline cases, particularly a case like hers, where she is really not sure about whether to go through this. You know, she could be a candidate on that left side. She probably is at this point. But she's kind of on the edge. And given that she didn't like really what happened on that first side, you know, she's really hesitant about going through this process, particularly at the risk of giving up her residual hearing in that left ear. So what do we do? Okay. So I'll tell you, um, um, you know, as I mentioned, there's a lot of anxieties. Of course, you know, the first thing, um, you know, Nick, you talk with her for a bit and says, well, look, let's get a CT just to make sure that electrodes in appropriately. Uh, more importantly, said, you know, why don't you come back? Let's remap your implant with our team, see what we can do to try to optimize performance. And if we can't do that, then we could start looking at re-implanting or implanting the other side. But let's see if we can optimize what we're looking at here. So the question that becomes, well, how do we actually reprogram the implant, okay? And why might we make those changes that we're talking about? 
Okay. Um, so the follow-up, she came back two months later. Okay. Full insertion. So the, the, the electrode itself looked perfectly in place. Everything kind of looked normal on that front, at least anatomically and surgically. Okay. So here's the thing. On the reprogramming, we didn't just kind of check to see the levels. You could barely hear the sound when things are comfortable. We started mucking with something called the frequency allocation table, which I'm going to go into more detail in just a second. What you should know is, um, um, you know, she normally was wearing something that's arranged from 188 to 79.38 hertz. Okay, so this is the classic allocation table. Again, I'll explain this in just a second. And so um, Sarah Perko is her audiologist. Sarah asked me to kind of sit in with her. And I recommended that we give her a couple of additional tables where we actually are eliminating low frequency information in these cases. Or so we are taking out low frequency information to see if this would help her. Okay. We told her use this for two months and come back and see us. All right. Interesting. Okay. Well, why did you do it? What made you think to do it? I'll um. I got about twenty five slides. It's going to go oh, through okay. the whole process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good preview here, right here. Okay, so when I talk about a frequency allocation table, and frankly, in a few minutes, we're going to go into the whole, like, how does the implant actually work? Because I think for your residents and fellows, you guys should understand, you know, this is, a, um, you know, not just beyond surgical, but when you put it in the ear, but what do these devices do, and what do they not do? But one of the things we look at is something called the frequency allocation table, which literally refers to what frequency ranges are assigned to a given electrode. All right, so if you take, again, we imagine like we've got our little schematic of the cochlea right here. Of course, we have our classic tonal capital organization. And then you imagine that each one of these white spots represent an electro contact in the schematic. Okay. So what we do with an implant is we try to mimic the tonotopic organization of the cochlea, you know, such that low frequencies are closer to the apex and higher frequencies are toward the base. So what we call a frequency allocation table is literally what frequency ranges are we assigning to a given electrode? Okay. So this, most patients walk around with the standard settings under the assumption that you can adapt to those settings that's going to elicit your best possible performance. But what I'm going to show you is there are lots of times where patients cannot adapt to the standard settings, and that's where we have to start looking at modifying things. Okay. So she comes back two months later. We've given her these two different frequency tables to try, listen to everything for a couple months, and what we actually saw in her case was a big significant improvement in her wow. ability to understand speech um, once things were remapped. Wow. So again, so if you notice, previously she was at 66% in quiet. Um, you put background noise and she was at 7%. Okay, so she basically fell apart in noise. So now, you know, when we're testing her, for example, um, we also had added the acoustic component back in. So even though she doesn't have much low frequency hearing, we wanted her to use the acoustic component with that hybrid device and use our remap frequency table. And we did this, we saw big, big, big improvements. So in this case, for example, with this frequency table here in her best aided condition, she went from 92% versus 66, 55 versus 7. Okay. So we had a massive improvement in her ability to function. Okay. And so in her case, you know, even kind of what's more important for her, she said, you know, that Alvin and the chipmunk quality thing that I heard, okay, a lot of that's kind of gone away. It's still not perfect, but a lot of other <coughs> things sound certainly a lot more natural right now. She's really happy with performance and sound quality. She says, you know, honestly, I think I'm hearing better than I've heard in years. And this is kind of the outcome that she was hoping to get from the first place when she actually got the implant. Um, and I can tell you then she came back and she saw me again last, um, uh, late last November. Her hearing had dipped a little bit on that left side. And now she's, um, she's going to pursue an implant on that left side. She's 100% comfortable with the situation now that we kind of got things squared away at the right side. Mm. Okay, so as George said, you know, we made a big change to the frequency allocation tables. And why would I think to strip out low frequency information in order to improve performance? Okay, so again, you know, what exactly did we do? Why did we do that? And more important, why did it work? All right, so this, so a lot of this comes back again. I want to kind of get into like, um, how does an implant actually work? Because I think to understand the sorts of changes that we're making, you got to understand how the implant actually works and what this thing is doing and frankly what it doesn't do. So remember, with an implant, when we put those electrodes in, you know, we're trying to map onto the tonotopic organization of the cochlea, okay? So remember, you know, particularly if you take your post-lingually deaf patients, you know, patients that have had hearing for 60 years, you know, they've got decades worth of listening to speech sounds in a certain way. So when we program these implants, we're trying to mirror that as closely as possible. And we do that by mimicking that tonotopic organization. But here's the kicker. There's some things that the sound that you get with an implant is very different than what happens with normal hearing, okay? 
one of the big changes that's going to happen, and I'll show you some diagrams in this second, is we lose a lot of spectral information. Okay, um, basically we get a very muddy signal. It's kind of smooth. So I like a phrase that I use kind of anecdotally with a lot of my patients. It's it's slightly it's a gross oversimplification, but I think it kind of underscores the points. I say, you know, if you have a normally hearing ear, you've got 15,000 cells in there that help to separate one pitch from another pitch. Now you're going from that to 12 to 22 electro contacts. So there's a massive loss of resolution right off the bat. Okay. The other thing that happens, frankly, is the temporal information. So how sound changes over time. Um, we deliver this a little more faithfully, but frankly, this isn't complete either. Okay. So let me talk about these things a little bit more. Okay. So how does an implant work? You take a complex sound like speech. Okay. Speech has lots of different frequencies. All right. And frankly, you know, the, the speech changes over time, the amplitude of it. So every time that like you get a different syllable in my voice, okay, that's frankly your vocal fold opening and closing, okay, the speech, the speech waveform goes up and down at this point. So we've got a complex sound like speech. This is done by our friend Alan Kahn. I know Rachel knows Alan quite well. So he's kind of this. So basically sound comes in yeah. and it goes to the speech processor. It's picked up by the microphone and then we have to take that very complex acoustic sound and put this into an electric signal. So how on earth do we do that? Okay. Well, again, remember, we're trying to mimic the tonotopic organization of the cochlea. So what this thing does is it decomposes that complex signal into different channels. Mm -hmm. All right? So some channels will consist of low frequency information. Some channels will consist of the information in the middle frequencies, some of the higher frequencies. So we take that very complex signal with lots of different frequencies, decompose that into different frequency channels. Okay? And each one of those frequency channels is going to get assigned to a given electrode. Now here's the kicker. Okay? These things, um, um, you know, these, these, even though we can assign this information with a given electrode, we, frankly, we can't assign all of it. All right? So if you notice, like, you know, when we look at the, the, a speech sound here, if we look at any sound, you know, there's kind of a general shape of a signal. Okay? And we call that the envelope. All right? So that's the general shape of a signal waveform. And you notice we got all these little fine things in between like this, okay? We call that fine structure, all right? Implants are really good at encoding the envelope. And the envelope is what you need for you to kind of understand speech in quiet environments. Implants are really, really bad at encoding all this fine structure, all right? We frankly just do not have a way to represent that electrically. And that's a problem because this is what helps you, the, the fine structure helps to give you a good sense of pitch, okay? So when patients say the music sounds really scuzzy with my implant, a big reason why is because we're stripping all this stuff out. We're preserving the envelope, because again, that's kind of how you can tell the general shape of the speech sound, you can understand speech from that, but we're losing all this stuff that kind of gives, you know, a sound its natural sound quality, okay? So basically then, we, we take this, we could basically, can make um, electrical impulses in that just follow the shape of the envelope. So in fact, we are recreating the envelope. So basically, we go from this, where again, we're trying to replicate this, and we take all that fancy stuff right here, and then we have electrical pulses that just fire really fast. And by firing these pulses really fast, we can recreate the shape of that envelope, and that is what is sent to the implant. Okay? So this is very different, again, than what people have when they have normal hearing. All right, and I always like showing this again, I think, because it's, um, you know, you're learning to do the surgery to put this stuff in the ear, but it's always like, how do these things actually work? What do they do and what do they not do? Okay, yeah? What is difficult about representing the fine structure? Because things like a keyboard, a piano keyboard or whatever, can emit you know, frequencies, I think, that are as high as that. Yeah. Why can't we, instead of sending it to a speaker, send it to like, an electrician? No, and that's a great point. So the question is, you know, what, what's so hard about representing the fine structure? Part of that is getting something fast enough um, to actually faithfully represent that. Those fluctuations within the fine structure can occur sometimes in the in thousands of times a second. Okay? And so to getting individual electrical pulses occurring a thousand times a second that are separate from one another, that's really hard to do. Um, particularly given, is another thing I like to say to patients or some of my more savvy ones, you think about it. With an implant, we have an electrical signal, okay, that's inside the cochlea. It's a cochlea filled with. Got endolymph inside there, okay. So basically, have electricity inside a fluid-filled medium. What happens when you put electricity inside water? 
smears. <laughs> then we've got to crank up enough electricity to get it over a thin layer of bone to whatever nerves have left and haven't died off on the other side. So first, we can't even make it go fast enough to represent those things. And if we could make it go fast enough, <clears throat> then we have to say, I could make it go represent all those without everything kind of smearing together. And we just can't do that right now. You know, I can tell you that this is kind of one of the holy grails within the implant world. You know, it's like if you can adequately represent fine structure, performance is going to go up and patients are going to be happier. But we are not there yet. You know, and that's something that, you know, I've got friends who are um, working kind of in this area. I know, like, one of the companies kind of has ways, uh, Medel likes to say that they can represent fine structure, but they don't, they don't really do it no matter what they say. Because, frankly, if they were better at it, then we'd see better performance. And that's just not the case. Questions? Okay, so as I mentioned, we send this to the brain at this point. All right, so again, as I mentioned before, the temporal fine structure gets recarded. It gets discarded. We toss that away. So again, we're just sending the information ideally to the right parts of the cochlea, low frequency <coughs> information to low frequency parts of the cochlea, and vice versa. But we're stripping out a lot of that information that we need to understand speech or to get a good, rich representation of sound. Okay. All right. So as I mentioned before, you know, like another big issue is what we call spread of excitation. As I mentioned, you know, you've got an electrical signal inside a fluid-filled medium. Electricity will smear inside water. You've got to crank it up to get over a layer of bone. And then, you know, normally you've got, um, you know, the normally functioning auditory system, we have dendrites that actually innervate the inner hair cells. Dendrites are the first things to die off when you're deprived of sound. Okay? And so basically what's left, ideally, is the spiral ganglion cell bodies. And in many cases, that may not even be there as well. So what can happen in those cases, we can get what we call spread of excitation. And we know this is one of the things that really hinders implant performance, okay? So here's, look, here's what a lot of cochlear implants try to do. They say, look, we know that there's, you take a given sound, okay? And there are spectral peaks, meaning there's more energy in some frequency regions than there is in others. And so if I assume that the, energy, the frequency regions that have the most energy are the part that I want to convey to you, because that's what's going to help you to understand speech. So for example, what the cochlear device does is it say, well, look, we're going to take the, say, like the top eight or top 12 frequency regions that have the most speech information, and we're only going to stimulate those electrodes. Okay? So we're just picking up these right through here. So basically, so these have the highest peaks right here, and so we're picking up basically peaks and deciding which electrodes to stimulate. So that sounds fine in theory, but I'm going to turn those electrodes on. But again, remember, what ha actually happens is that just because you turn one electrode on and make that thing fire, that is a guarantee that you're only going to hit neurons through to that. Things smear out a little bit. Things spread around. Okay? And for some individuals, we can get a lot of smearing. So you notice how, you know, if you have a regular acoustic signal right here, we have very sharp representations of all these spectral peaks right here. Okay? And that's what if you've got normal hearing in this room, this is what you get. And you take somebody with significant smearing across the electrode array, and suddenly that signal gets a heck of a lot muddier. And we think this is one of the big reasons why many patients with implants actually have trouble in background noise and other environments, okay? Um, actually, your ability to kind of separate little peaks like that if you have an implant is related to your ability to understand speech, particularly in background noise. Mm -hmm. Here's the other big challenge, and this is kind of segueing into why do we start mucking with the frequency allocation table? It's a concept of something we call a frequency mismatch, okay? So you take a cochlear implant, and they can actually deliver a mismatch between you know, what the speech processor says should happen at a given electrode and the neurons that we're actually stimulating. Yes. So remember, you take your average cochlea, we go from about 20,000 uh, 20, hertz, about 20 hertz at the apex right here. We have this on the top of organization. So we're trying to replicate that with the cochlear implant electrode. Okay, but remember, these electrodes for most individuals, they're not going, in most cases, they're not going entirely into the cochlea. And even the cases where they do, innervation of the cochlea is different in the very apex than it is in other regions of the cochlea, okay? So you get situations like this where one electrode might say, okay, this should be neurons. We're going to stimulate um, frequency regions of 250 to 500 hertz. But we're stimulating neurons that your brain is used to thinking is at 1,000 hertz, okay? So you've got decades of representations of listening to sound like this, and now I'm giving you something different, okay? So we call this a frequency mismatch, all right? And this is really problematic uh, for patients with cochlear implants. We know this is a big issue. 
Okay. So I'm going to give you a, a let me give you guys a demo. Have you guys heard like uh, demos of what cochlear implants sound like? No. Okay. Some of you have, some of you haven't. So these are, so let me give you a demo of what things sound like first with the spectral degradation and with the big frequency mismatch on there. Okay. And let me see if you guys can understand what's being said here. Everybody get that? We're scoring seven years ago. Okay, that's good. That's, that's actually, that's, that's what most people get. That's a good guess. I'll, I'll play one more time. <laughs> you didn't hear that. Okay. No way in hell. Okay, so that's really hard. So if you take a patient with a big frequency mismatch and a um, the spectral <coughs> degradation, you know, this is why when patients often, when you first turn the device on, they don't, they, they get noise, but they don't really get much else. Okay. Now, say you could adapt to that frequency mismatch, or say we can eliminate that frequency mismatch altogether. What might something sound like? <clears throat> so it's just the spectral deg degradation, no mismatch. Yep. Did you guys understand yep. that? Yes. Did you get? Uh, Four score and seven years ago, our fathers. Yeah, but, that, but that's good. That, that, that's actually really good. So we'll play it one more time. <laughs> and then this is the original sound right here. Give you an idea as to how. Four and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation. That's Peter. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually, that, that, that's a... Uh, um, that's David Pisoni, who's a legendary speech scientist and does a lot of work with implant recipients. So you can see again, you know, when you have a spectral mismatch and a frequency of uh, spectral degradation and a frequency mismatch, things get really hard for people. And frequency mismatches beyond a certain point are thought to be even more damaging for speech understanding than just having the, the degradation that we see. Okay. And again, these are the sorts of things anecdotally, when you see your patients, what sorts of things might they say to you after they come see a nerd like me and I turn the device on? They say, yeah, you know, um, I hear Darth Vader, I hear Mickey Mouse, I hear Minnie Mouse. Some patients, like even nine months later, I'm nine months later, I still hear them. Um, I heard Minnie Mouse for two months and it kind of cleared up, okay? Somebody says, uh, I never heard Darth, but uh, Minnie and I are best friends. You know, so that, <laughs> patients always, it's when you talk to patients, right, when you first turn the device on, they hear a number of things, but almost rarely it may be speech-like, but it's certainly not what they heard prior to lose their hearing. Okay. Patients have to learn to get used to that process. Okay. So again, you know, this is kind of what I mentioned, you know, when we've got the mismatch between what the electrodes say, and otherwise, this is kind of a case where I could say, you know, electrode one should be, say, 200 hertz, but I'm hitting a neuron up here at 1,000 hertz. And that's a real challenge. Now let's come back to our patient right here, you know, think about how do we address these issues. So our patient here, remember that these hybrid electrodes, these hybrid arrays, they are short electrode arrays. Okay, so these things, are, um, they don't go in as far into the cochlea as normal as, as a conventional electrode array. So if you have a shorter electrode array, do you think we'd have a bigger frequency mismatch or a smaller one? Shorter is bigger. Yep, yeah, shorter is going to be bigger. Yeah. Okay, so the likelihood, remember our patient at the beginning, she's saying, you know, everything kind of sound like Minnie Mouse. There's way too high pitch, kind of out on the chipmunks. These sorts of things keep coming back. Okay, so we've got a frequency mismatch. You know, when I hear those, I'll tell you, when I hear, when I have a patient say to me, things sound like Minnie Mouse or things sound really high pitched, right off the bat, like 95% of the time I'd say this is kind of what the issue is that we're dealing with. So how do we address this? And my theory is, you know, on a big picture level, there's two ways to kind of get at this issue. One is just remap the whole implant entirely, okay? And two, you know, in a perfect world, we try to minimize the mismatch in the first place. So I'm going to show you guys some research that I was involved with, actually, frankly, prior to coming here, and then, frankly, since being here, um, where we're looking at it, attacking the problem of frequency mismatch in, in, in both ways. Okay. So one, um, if you want to address it via mapping, you're going to have to adjust the frequency allocation table. Um, there is no real other way to do that at this point. So this is Mario Sversky. Mario is my postdoc mentor. Um, so prior to coming here, I was a, I was a, a first postdoc and then faculty member at NYU. Um, and we did a lot of work looking at how to adjust frequency allocation tables in individuals with cochlear implants. And we developed a number of different tools that can do so, okay? So one, for example, is one thing we say, well, look, you know, what if, what if you can basically kind of set it up like where you can turn a dial where people can hear and basically adjust whatever, adjust your implant to what sounds best to you? Kind of like almost like you tune a radio and you kind of find the radio station, you kind of make it work. Well, what if you could tune your implant in the same way? 
So what we did is we kind of built a tool that allows us to adjust the frequency table in real time, all right, where patients could listen to running speech, and then you could make basically kind of adjust things up and down and decide what's most intelligible for you. So let me give you guys a demo of what this kind of process sounded like here. So this is a, a children's book. I mean, if you, again, we'll see at the beginning, I expect when I put this on, you're probably not going to understand very much at all. And as that gray region starts to go up, you can see we have a very fancy GUI here that we built, you know. <laughs> but as this gray region goes up, this event, over about 20, 30 seconds, this is going to get progressively more intelligible. Why don't you listen here and let's see what you get. when you first put this, you get nothing. Yeah. And as we gradually start to shift this, we can eventually find the region that elicits the most intelligible signal. Wow. Okay? Yeah. So this is, a, this is one way. Ideally, this is kind of like our fantasy way of doing it. You know, there's, there's other ways we kind of looked at, um, you know, I, I can tell you building this stuff is hard. <laughs> it's, in many cases, these things are literally one kind of in the world. Another approach is kind of something I kind of call like an acoustic battleship. You know, <laughs> you take one signal, you know, play that signal with different frequency cables, let people click on the screen and find the table that elicits the best intelligibility. So let me give an example of what this process might look like. So you might start with, um, oh, that's really soft. Let's see if we can get, it's that hard to hear? Can anybody understand that sentence? Up here. Oh, sorry, this one's, is, let me see if I could. <coughs> it's a little soft. So what, ideally what this, how this would work, okay, well that's certainly the most intelligible. But as you click around different spots on the grid, you can find the region that elicits the, the frequency allocation table that elicits maximal speech intelligibility. Okay? So these are, and these are the sorts of comments that uh, patients make as you go through this. Okay, so this is a standard table to say, you know, this sounds really high pitched, I don't like it so much. So you, you shift it down way big in fr frequency and you say, well, you know, the shoe sounds like Sue. There's no more P, which makes sense. We basically strip that everything above about 3,500 hertz. Well, here now we've got the shh. It's pretty good, but it's not the best. You put a lot of high frequencies back in there. Oh, you know, that's a real shh, you know. So these are sort of the comments that patients make as you go through this to find, okay, this is the most natural. What elicits the best speech understanding? Okay. And if I actually test this with cochlear implant recipients, you know, the default assumption you'd make, you know, if you've gotten used to what you're wearing and there's no frequency mismatch anymore, and you've gotten used, or if you get learned to adapt to any frequency mismatch that's there, okay, that if I give you a chance to pick what, you're, to, what sounds best to you, you should pick exactly what you've been wearing every day for the last year or two, all right? But if you haven't adapted, if there's some sort of frequency mismatch that's a little off, then we'd expect that you'd pick something different. So this is kind of like what I would expect, like kind of your null hypothesis, your complete adaptation. You've gotten used to your frequency table. If this is a standard table, and I give you a chance, imagine these are like individual listeners, they should pick the same frequency range as what they're wearing every day. Except that's not what actually happens with patients, okay? Well, let me rephrase. Some patients do do that, all right? So we've got a lot of patients basically pick exactly what they're wearing on a day-to-day -day basis. Which makes sense. I mean, if you're walking around with something every day for a year or two and you can't hear without it, you know, you could make an argument. Why would you ever pick anything different? But you've got another group of patients, about half of patients, pick something very different. In some cases, they're shifting at higher frequency. In some cases, they're shifting at lower in frequency. But in either case, you know, they, they're picking, you know, the, the implication here is whatever they're hearing they're, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, they haven't fully gotten used to. And if I give you a chance, you might something like something else a little bit better. You cannot do this with the standard mapping stuff, all right? If I take recipients of the advanced bionics device, okay, we get the same thing. Half the patients pick something very similar to what they're wearing every day, and a lot of other people will pick something that's different. Shifted usually, most cases usually shifted higher frequency, occasionally lower. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I would say to you, what I'm going to show you, what I, I go through this to kind of tell you guys, so like, 
frequency mismatch is a problem with implant recipients. These are people with full-length electrode arrays. They're not even like a hybrid user, like the patient that I showed you at the beginning. And for half the people, if you give a chance, they pick something different than what they're wearing on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay? So that suggests we, there's a lot more that we could be doing with regard to fine-tuning the device or finding a way to minimize any frequency mismatch from the beginning. Okay? And in particular, I think you're going to see adaptation. You're going to have problems like this if the electrode is really short or really long. Okay? Because those are most likely to elicit some sort of mismatch. Okay? And here's the way, you know, the tricky part here, I could say, well, how to make this more accessible. So this is work that Mario started doing after I left. Everything, that, kind of all the, the prototyping and the work with the implant patients is all done while I was there. Problem is, like, that stuff that we were using is literally like um, um, one in a kind. You know, there's like one of those in a world for pretty much everything that we've got. You know, we built it all from scratch, and that's not really sustainable. Um, so, and it's a very controlled clinical environment. So what Mario and them have worked on since I left is developing an app, in effect, that kind of bypasses the front end of the speech processor that could theoretically allow patients to do this in the real world and try to predict what sounds best to them. And I've, as I've told Mario, I said, um, um, you know, when you guys kind of get this ready to go on a full-time basis, you know, send it out here and we're going to run it with like 50 people like uh, within a couple weeks because I'll be really curious. So this is something, again, it's just a way of tricking the front end of the speech processor um, basically altering the signal that goes into it to mimic, you know, um, and then this way we can basically allow patients to pick what frequency allocation table works best for them. I think for time's sake I'll skip this. So, come back to our original case here. We had a patient that was not doing well. We adjusted her frequency allocation table to eliminate or certainly to reduce the frequency mismatch and we saw massive improvements in performance. You know, again, you take um, going in quiet or going in background noise from 7% to 55%, okay? Big, big, big improvements at this point, you know? And as you know, frankly, you know, she's, she's much happier. If you're going to remap somebody to deal with these sorts of issues, you know, the only way to do that is to adjust the frequency allocation table, okay? I, I could tell you, like, uh, um, this, is a, this is an area where, where um, you know, I did this for a long time. For most of the time, if basically you shift it up to about... Um, Shifting it, the frequency table above about 500 hertz on the low frequency end um, tends to hinder performance too much because then you're just stripping out too much low frequencies. But things in the 300 to 400 hertz range tend to work best is kind of what we're seeing. And there's a little bit of data coming out from other groups that are kind of are replicating kind of what we found. Now, this is some work on, you know, here at Stanford here, another possibility is, well, look, maybe just minimize the concept of a mismatch in the first place. So Ksenia and Eamon have been big parts of this project right here. So this is um, what we call our OtoPlan project, okay? So this is work with Nick. Um, Shana Cooperman's a med student here at Stanford who's been working with this. And of course, uh, Ksenia and Eamon have been helping out on this quite a bit as well. So what we're staring at here, so again, what is OtoPlan? Okay, well this is a, um, um, this is, this is even FDA approved yet. This is a tablet-based software developed by Bedell. And their assumption is, is basically if you load a CT into this, you pick some anatomical landmarks, and this will automatically estimate your cochlear duct length. Wow. Okay? Wow. And then from that, then you could say, okay, what size electrode should I pick, given the size of this person's cochlea, to minimize any sort of frequency mismatch? Okay? And that's, so it's a reasonable assumption, you know, and I think it's one that, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, the reality is it's like we know that cochlear duct lengths, um, you know, all the literature shown, they can vary from about 25 to about 40 millimeters. Whereas your cochlear implant electrodes are consistently the same length each time, okay? So a 20, 24 millimeter electrode can be in very different parts of the cochlea for somebody with a small cochlea versus a large cochlea. And that's why we have some of these frequency mismatch issues. So that adult approach is say, well, look, you know, we're going to develop electrodes of different lengths, and we're going to give you surgeons a tool that will allow you to uh, um, estimate the cochlear dog length to work it from there. So again, this is not FDA approved yet, you know, but I... I um, my former research audiologist went to work for them, and we kind of convinced them to give us a copy so that we could go through this. So we've been doing some work looking at reliability, but then also we've been taking this back and looking at outcomes, um, particularly in the sort of way that you guys might when you're, when you're um, um, dealing with patients down the road, okay? And so what we did is we started looking at thinking about, okay, well, if we talk about frequency mismatch, what we're really talking about is like cochlear coverage. So meaning like how much of the cochlea is that electrode covering? Okay, and we created something called like an electrode to cochlear duct length ratio, which is basically, you know, it's kind of like if you have an electrode of a given size and the cochlea is a given size, you know, what's that ratio between the two? So you can have a case where the electrode is much smaller than the cochlea, and then what we're calling your ECDLR, that ratio, is going to be much less than one. 
or you could have a case where the, the, um, um, these things line up almost completely, in which case, of course, your ratio should be 1. You could have a case where it's greater than 1, say, if you, you can't get certain electrodes all the way in, if the electrode's too big for the cochlea. Or what more often happens is rather you don't see people leaving stuff out, they kind of just shove it in, and the cochlea, the electrode gets stuck. <laughs> It, it's funny, you look at reports and everything, everybody always says, I have a full insertion, you know? Yeah. But the problem is, what does it take to get the full insertion? And sometimes, what you see is the electrode will transverse different regions of the, of the cochlea. And actually, this, when this sort of thing happens, it's really bad for, for performance, okay? We want to avoid this sort of scenario. Okay. Actually, I think you're better off with this than you are with this, to be honest. Can you actually physically get around the modialis? Hmm. Well, the, the depends on the electrode type, but yeah, I mean, a, a certain you know the transition now has been toward thinner and floppier electrodes, so they could get it deeper and deeper into the cochlea, huh. or to try to preserve hearing, like you see with the hybrid devices right here. But you can get around the bend surgically. Yeah, yes, you can. Yes, huh. you can. The, the deeper you go, the floppier it has to be. Huh. So there's um you know there's still like one electrode that's really stiff. You know, for example, if you have bony growth, you know, you take your post energetic patients, you have some cochlear ossification of the cochlea, and then you need something pretty stiff to get it through. But, uh, but the trend increasingly has been toward floppier and floppier electrodes. But when you have that, the theory allows you to kind of get it around and get it deeper into the cochlea. Mm. Okay. So we are looking at this ratio, all right, of the cochlear size to the, or the electrode length to the cochlear size. And then how does that influence speech understanding right here? And what's interesting is what we see is there's kind of a sweet spot, okay, where if you're kind of within this nice middle range, where scores tend to be pretty good, but if you get outside this range, performance tends to be worse. Okay. And this is brand new. These data have not been published. Nobody's got um, this, this sort of thing out here yet. So we are, um, um, this, is, this is work that's ongoing at Stanford. We just presented for the first time last uh, two weeks ago at the um, ARO meeting that was in San Jose. And then um, Shane will be presenting more of it with Ksenia Kazan coming up next month. Okay. You take individuals with a very... Um, with a low ECDLR, so meaning the, the electrode to the electro length relative to the cochlear length, the electrode doesn't cover very much of the cochlea. Or individuals with a larger one, you notice that these people on average tend to have worse speech understanding scores than things kind of falling within the middle. So basically you want to kind of be in this sweet spot where it doesn't have to line up complete, match completely, but maybe like a little bit smaller. So if you get your electrode length a little bit smaller than the length of the cochlea itself, that seems to less a better speech understanding. If it gets too small, that's bad. And if it's too big, that seems to be a little worse, too. And what we did then kind of for statistical analysis, and we collapsed what we called suboptimal ECDLRs, basically too small or too large in one group, and compared it to the groups that were kind of seemed to be in the right spot. And we saw significant differences in speech understanding abilities across the two. So this kind of fits with the idea too much of a frequency mismatch is bad. Okay. And what the nice thing here, so this is kind of looking at our data with already implanted patients, but what this would suggest is that good surgeons like you can go in in the future, look at a tool like this, you know, get an estimate of what the cochlear length, um, length is, and then pick an appropriate electrode accordingly. Now, what I, I like showing this because it shows that it's not just picking a longer electrode, period. You know, the assumption that people make is, well, yeah, okay, just pick a long electrode, you don't have to worry about this. Okay, but actually, you know, notice we've got a lot of overlap. This is 24 millimeter electrodes, 28s and 31s, but we still have overlap sometimes across the 24s and the 28s and the 31s and the 28s as well. Okay, so and if we just plot like, you know, our speech understanding scores as a function of electro length, there's no difference. Okay, so the electro length itself doesn't seem to make the difference. What seems to matter is how much of that cochlea is being covered by the electrode, and that seems to matter. And that fits with the concept that we're trying to minimize some sort of frequency mismatch, okay? So this is tools I think, you know, I'm willing to bet in a few years that you guys will all have access to this. This is, um, they're, they're looking to get it FDA approved in the near future, and I fully expect it's going to happen. And I think, um, and I know when I presented this to Medel uh, um, a couple weeks ago, they were really excited by it. So, okay. So again, case one summary. So again, we'll talk a lot about one case here, but good time. So, but again, frequency mismatch is a problem. Okay, and if patients can't get used to it, it can be a real issue, realistically. I can tell you my, my um, research fellow, Michael Smith, we're actually uh, developing a new project. We're looking at adaptation, um, look at two frequency mismatch, because I can predict certain, if you have not adapted, we should predict you should make very specific errors. So we're going to look to see that. And we've got other projects which say, then can I train you out of it if you make a mistake? If you cannot adapt, can we train you out of it? 
But clinical, <coughs> what's a good thing for you guys to know, if you hear a patient say, you know, um, things sound like Mickey Mouse, they sound like Alvin of the Chipmunks, really high-pitched, that's almost certainly a case where the electrode is not deep enough into the cochlea, okay? And the, what I would say is that you could get around this by adjusting the frequency allocation table, but doing so will strip out some low-frequency information, and so you've got to be careful, because for some patients, if you take out the low-frequency, there's a trade-off. The assumption is I will make it sound more natural, but I have to do so by stripping out low-frequency information. And we got a lot of work with normal hearing people. A paper I published a few years ago kind of suggests that people, you know, uh, people tend to balance the trade-off between wanting as much low-frequency information as possible while things not getting sound too weird. So with that, okay, here's the second case. All right. The deep dive on one. I'll, I'll go a little faster through this next one here. And so this is a um, completely different, well, it's different and it's not different. Okay, so here, uh, we'll put this to our residents. If you saw a five-year-old coming in with a hearing test like this, what's your first thought? Yeah. They could probably get to implant the person, right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm cheating a little bit here. This is, a, I mean, this is a child who had no behavioral response to sound whatsoever. Now, actually, it's a little more complex than this, of course. You know, we've got um, this is a five-year-old, sudden hearing loss, okay? And then not only that, then they stopped, um, largely stopped talking as well. Okay, so there's some other things going on beyond. They were normally developing up to this point. Um, they had a lot of fever, a lot of headache, and ended up being um, hospitalized with encephalitis. Okay, with the, they had significant inflammation of the bilateral temporal lobes. You know, and this, and this kid was he was in a pretty sick state for a long period of time. But the one of the primary beyond his um, um, the inflammation, where it primarily seemed to have a predominant effect, was with the hearing. Okay, we had no response to sound whatsoever. Now he's the kicker. Okay, he had perfectly normal um, um, otocuse commissions. So remember, these are signs of like a normal cochlear function. So just to kind of, if you guys do one of these on yourselves, we have things like the noise floor. They want to see the energy from the outer cells has to exceed the noise floor. So both ears, he has really robust otocuse commissions. Things look good there. And we did the ADR on this kid as well. ADR comes back perfectly normal. Okay. So if you look at the peripheral of the cochlea, and you look at his lower brain stem, everything checks out great, right? He has no response to sound, and he's not talking anymore. So this kind of kind of question at this point is like, well, what's um, what's going on? You know, and clearly we know this is tied back to the inflammation that this kid is experiencing. But it's also like, you know, we kind of started when um, the Claire Umida, one of my audiologists, she brought this to me, and we were talking about it. And it's like, well, how do we better get a better handle on what this kid's deficits are? And I said, well, look, you know, I think what we could be doing is not just kind of stick to the classic ABR on these kids, but let's test further up the auditory system, start looking at higher level cortical or auditory growth potentials to see function beyond the ABR, and where does this kid's response to sound break down? Okay, where does it stop? Okay, so just to kind of, so what I'm going to show you here, data is like uh, stuff that we did with this child. Uh, we looked at three basic responses. Okay, so of course we looked at your classic ABR. That's what all of us are used to seeing. That's what you're taught about, what you're trained on. We have a, I'm going to show you data on something called a middle latency response and then the cortical response, which is essentially what we call a P1M1 complex. And all these, so we presented everything at the, just the click stimulus at 70 dBHL, okay, classic, and this is recorded the same record, the same way you record the ABR, okay. So with the right equipment, we can do this in the clinic, and we did this in the clinic, you know, here in our clinic at Stanford, um, and we're actually modifying some of the equipment to make it a little more easier to do, uh, a little easier, okay. So classic ABR, if you guys are used to looking at ABRs, actually look at ABR waveforms, you know, we're looking at here. Sort of, you know, I know Rachel deals with these every day. Okay, but, but look, remember the ABR, this is a, a collection of um, um, five peaks, you know, one, three, and five are the largest ones. They occur within the first few milliseconds. This is thought wave one right here, which normally occurs by one and a half, 1.8 milliseconds. It's thought to reflect like the first synapse of your inner hair cell and the auditory nerve, okay? And we just send as we get to wave five, which this is your largest one. This is what we use then to um, um, diagnose hearing threshold at this point. The, the, so this is thought to be basically termination in the um, um, in the lateral meniscus into the inferior colliculus. It's kind of what we thought we we're looking at here. Okay. So the ABR, this is a classic ABR. Okay. Gorgeous. We got one, three, five. Both ears look really good. Okay. Okay. Well, let's talk about the middle latency response here. So this is actually a response that occurs a little higher up the stream, okay? So instead of looking in the brain stem, um, this is thought largely to occur in the thalamocortical pathway. And you notice if you look at the latency of these peaks right here, you can see these are, um, you know, your ABR is all kind of happening in this region right here. But we see like an NA, a PA, and an ND. 
The PA is kind of the largest right here, the PA, the PV. These are the largest, about 22 to 30 milliseconds. This is about 40 to 50 milliseconds. Okay. So people have sometimes tried to look at these to look at hearing thresholds. Um, the field moved away from it because they're kind of a little sensitive to sleep. So if a kid's sleeping, these things um, are smaller, and therefore it's not as reliable at this point. But we can do, again, what we think the primary generator for this is an infallible cortical pathway. So we've got a child here with, with problems. We know we've got inflammation within the brain. Does the child have a normal middle latency response or not? Okay. And what we could see is we could see the response, but now this thing starts to degrade, particularly when we're stimulating the left ear. Okay. So you can see here in the right ear, you know, we've got this, uh, the PA, PB, or I'm sorry, so the P1, M1, and the PB right here. So you can see, or PA, M, A, PB, I'm sorry. So you see the right ear right here, you know, the shape of this is pretty straightforward right here. And so that's a pretty decent MLR from that right side, okay? But notice, so on the left side, you know, we've kind of got this. We've got some double peaks here, we've got this. But you notice how squiggly kind of up and down this is, okay? That's a sign of what we call it poor morphology, you know? If I do this on one of you and you're sitting still, this is going to be like a nice clean trace. But when you see something like this, you think either this kid is squirming or the something isn't right literally kind of within the brain or how something is being encoded, okay? So we're seeing here again, once so we go higher up the system, we've got a quick, gorgeous ABR, you go a little higher up, the MLR is starting to fall apart on that left side. And what if we go higher up the auditory system right here, okay? So we can have something called what we call the cortical, the P1, N1, P2 complex. So again, P1, this is a peak around 50 milliseconds in adults, a little later in kids, about 50 in adults, N1, and then the P2. There's lots of other things, but basically this is the earliest. This is actually one of the most largest and robust in children. Um, so I'll show you guys a little bit kind of why that's important there. Okay, and this is thought largely to originate um, from Heschel's gyrus. So this, now we get primary auditory cortex. So we're really kind of up in this part of the brain in here. Okay, and the M1, you know, I think there's many, many generators to this M1 component, okay? But again, this is what you need to know is the N1 component. This part right here, this is what we're looking for here. These things come from the cortex, okay? There's no brain stem contributions to these anymore. So if you're seeing deficits here in the N1 P2 complex or the P1 N1 complex, that means we have a problem up here as opposed to kind of within our ears, so to speak. I'm gonna skip past for sake of time. Okay. You're doing okay. And what we can see here now, that when we stimulate that left side, there's no more response. Okay, so this child does not have a response anymore. You can see, you know, what we want to see is kind of a, a peak right around here between 50 and 100 milliseconds. Then we should see a big negative peak between about 100 to 150. Um, ideally, in adults, this would be around 100 to 112. This may be kind of have an N1, but this is kind of a scuzzy N1 on that right side. The left side, there's just nothing there anymore. Okay. So this totally fits the idea of this child, the significant inflammation that we're seeing within the temporal lobes, okay? The point where as we get lower in the brainstem, everything is perfectly normal. We get to the middle reaches, the thalamic cortical regions, the response starts to fall apart. By the time we get to the cortex, it's either a little sloppy, like again, this isn't really much of the N1, maybe at best, you know? And there's nothing really here going on that left side. Okay, so what I'd say, you know, and this is kind of a, and I told this man, I was just like, look, look, we can use these sorts of things to assess the integrity of the auditory system multiple levels, okay? So we don't have to, when I showed this to neurology, they were ecstatic. You know, they've been following this kid. He'd been um, hospitalized for a couple months and he'd gotten out, but they were, because they were saying, look, we know we saw inflammation in the temporal lobe, but it was hard for us to say, like, exactly why this child wasn't hearing, you know, responding to sound any longer, you know? And the question is, is it a primary auditory region or is it an association auditory region, like a, like a Wernicke's or, or some sort of aphasia? And so this case here, you know, what we're doing is we're showing good integrity at lower levels, and as we go higher and higher, this thing deteriorates. Okay. All right. I can tell you it's getting better, you know. So this, um, we saw him actually, um, we saw him a couple months ago, um, repeated this process, and we saw, again, normal EBR, the MLR was um, there both years. It wasn't the best, but it was there. And we actually saw pressing cortical responses in both sides, okay. So that's, that's an improvement over what we had before. They're not the prettiest things in the world, but they're there. And actually, this is data. This is an audiogram that was literally done about eight hours ago. We got wow. lucky. He actually wow. came in today. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, yeah. I mean, so, they, so we have, um, so wow. he's got, he's got, you know, his hearing isn't normal by any stretch, particularly. If you look at the left side, things kind of spike around a little bit there. But, but this is a, um, 
but he's got still continues to have the normal DPOEs. He's responding to sound. Um, he's got five or six words now. I think it's um, mama, dada, um, baba, he's got a word for the dog, word for his sister, um, word for his baby legs that he likes to play with, you know. So. How, do you, how do you explain the better performance in the left ear, which was a problem way before? Uh, you know, that, that's a great question. You know, one, I, short answer is word, I don't know. Okay, the, the most recent report from neurology suggested that the inflammation um, was persisting a little more on the right side, but it got a little bit much better on the left side. And so I would speculate that that's kind of what we're seeing there. And certainly, you know, the, with, 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 on the left side previously, we also went from a um, no response and now we're kind of getting response. Ksenia? Isn't there also some like part of the crossover? There's a there's a significant number of fibers that cross over from one side to the other, and so the kind of the question is always like you know when you record, um, if you were if I had 256 electrodes on your head, if I stimulate the right ear, I'd get a bigger response usually on your left temporal lobe than on the right. And the tricky part here is when we're doing this, I got one electrode, you know, basically kind of on the forehead like this, and so I don't I, that doesn't tell me where this is coming from necessarily. What I can say is, you know, we've, we're, we're getting much better responses there, and certainly his hearing and things improved on that left side. Now just in the last couple of minutes, I'll tell you, there's, there's other things we can do, and I've been talking with Melissa Tribble and others um, about this. You know, for example, you know, people, you can look at cortical potentials as a way to assess maturity of the auditory system, okay? So you take a child that gets a cochlear implant, they get implanted late, that P1 complex might still be present, but it's later in time than in a child with normal hearing. Mm -hmm. And so let me show, um, so this is basically, you could say that, you know, what we look at in young children is a P1 complex is actually kind of a good index of maturation at this point. So here, you take children that are implanted, what we're doing is showing latency of the P1, the age of the child here, okay? So we've got latency on this axis. Anything kind of within this region we consider to be normal. So kids that got implanted over, said, this is work from a new Sharma. This is kind of classic uh, um, work that was published about 10 years ago or so. But kids that are implanted over the age of seven years, they all had abnormal P1 latencies. Well, pretty much, I guess one person had normal, but almost the entire group had abnormal. Kids that are implanted between three and a half and six and a half years, you know, you can see there's still some of abnormal latencies, but you have a lot more kids mm -hmm. that have normal P1 latencies. Mm -hmm. You take children that are implanted less than three and a half years of age, and the vast majority of these kids had normal maturational development. Okay. So again, beyond looking just squarely like at a classic uh, um, a speech perception score, you know, the, looking at these sorts of potentials in kids gives us another way, another assay of kind of how well is this kid doing, is this kid maturing appropriately. Okay. Uh, I'll skip this. Yeah, and this is a, another example right here. I think this is kind of a fun. You take a, take a child that was uh, um, implanted at a much younger age. You know, when they first turn the device on, the P1 latency, if it was present at all, was very, very, very late. And as the child got more and more experience with the implant, suddenly the P1 started occurring in a normal region. Huh. So once you stimulate the system, things start working normally. Okay. You take the child that got implanted much later, okay, and whereas the response, just because inherently the response is more mature, they still never kind of coming into a normal range right here. Huh. So again, this is another way for us to track performance theoretically. And it's something now that when we get the new IHS system, you know, these are things that we can be doing in our own clinic as well. That's why we put in a capital budget request. So. Okay. Um, I think I'll stop right here. I'm um, just saying, look, I, you know, I, I said audiograms and beyond, but what, what I really focused on is beyond. I mean, it's kind of two cases, but it's really kind of a deep dive on things we can do beyond conventional measures of hearing assessment. Um, you guys have heard me beat the speech and noise drum for a long time again, kind of moving beyond what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And these are examples here of things we can be doing, whether with the cochlear implants, whether looking at performance with kids as well. But I think, you know, what I always like to stress is we're going to do these sorts of things. You really got to know what you're doing in terms of what you're measuring and why, okay? You know, it's um, like I tell some of my, um, some, some of my, uh, I tell people, um, audiologists all the time, I say, you know, manufacturer, say if you're, the hearing aids or implants, you know, they should be a resource for you, but they should not be the source of information. You know, you have to learn to know this stuff on your own. So this way, if you've got to gonna go off the beaten path, so to speak, kind of what and why. But I think in doing this, if you really know this stuff, we can improve patient performance and we frankly help you guys to better manage your patients as well. So... With that, I think I will uh, stop and open the questions. Matt, do we know what happens 
when you put an implant and it's garbled, but two months later adaptation occurs. Where does the adaptation occur and why does it happen? Yeah, but it, so that, that's one of the uh, um, holy grail questions. I mean, look, it's, it's, most of it is almost certainly on a cortical basis. Yeah. I think, and, you know, one of the questions, I think for some cases it's, adap it's adapting to that frequency mismatch where we know initially when you put a big frequency mismatch on people, it's almost unintelligible. And if I get it, you listen to that for a period of time, it gets easier and easier. Yeah, and why? Why? Well, see, I think, I think what's happening with you take an adult that's lost their hearing is you've got decades worth of representations of speech sounds in your brain. Okay. And basically what you're trying to do is take this new sound, you know, with it's giving you representations yeah. of speech sounds that do not match what you had before. Yeah. So you have to take this new sound you're getting and kind of map it onto those old representations or you have to create new representations of speech sounds. I think that's the adaptation process. I think that's what people are doing. Uh -huh. Is there either, I think most of the time, I think when people, like you flip it on and they do better, it's because the lineup between what the implant is saying and speech is like, right. lines up a little more closely with what people's kind of your internal representation is. But I think that's what people are doing is they have to develop new representations of speech for this very degraded signal that's very different from what they had before. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that was great, Matt. I, I'm going to show my ignorance. I, I, no. I missed the earlier part, but are, are all these patients bilaterally implanted, or does it matter? Um, Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Well, actually, one thing I've got data. Um, if you get really nerdy, I've got data where we I um, had you can have individuals with different amounts of frequency mismatch each year. Okay. Oh, wow. So I had stuff where I would let people adjust the frequency table on one side to match what they heard on the other side. Okay. And half the times it lines up, and sometimes it's different. And what's interesting is then I said, well, look, you know, let's have you um, pick, what's, um, pick what matches across the two. Okay, so just adjust one side to match what you're hearing on the other side. Okay, and so about half the time, 40% of the time, people pick something different across the two that matched it. And then what was really interesting, if I had you pick what matched in terms of speech intelligibility versus if I had you kind of like, if I played a pure tone and just said adjust this one side till the pitch of that tone is the same, people would pick something different if I'm having you match the pitch of things where so I'm trying to have you match speech. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because, again, it's like what, um, if the speech, again, could make it match kind of perceptually off pitch, it's like I have to strip out all this low frequency information. And if I strip out too much low frequency information, it hurts you to really understand speech. So people are constantly trying to juggle that. So it's so it doesn't matter. So it can happen whether it's one side or both sides. And it's not the same. You know, and so you'll, you'll talk to patients that will say, yeah, you know, this here sounds pretty normal, and this here sounds, still sounds a little wonky. But if I test them on this, it might still score the same percentage amount. Hmm. Like I, I have another case I could have shown that uh, Nick and I, we ended up, this is a case where we actually ended up re-implanting. It's a patient that um, had a sudden um, shift of the electrode, where suddenly three electrodes basically were displaced from the cochlea. Um, of course, the pitch of what he was hearing went up tremendously. Um, I remapped it. I got his speech understanding close to what it was before, but he still hated the sound quality. So again, speech understanding doesn't always line up with the sound. Um, could be sorts of sound quality things, but you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the frequency yeah. adaptation table yep. trying to match up the, the tone topic on the issue with the uh, electrode. Has there been any work to try to empirically determine where each electrode sits? Absolutely. Words, yep. You implant it, and right away maybe you do an ABR and you stimulate one electrode only. At, uh, you sweep frequencies and see where it's maximal, because presumably. Uh, the reason where, where it's maximal is where it's sitting. Can you do that for all of them? And then you yeah, so people, so that's an ongoing, so there's a, uh, um, Charles Lim actually is doing some similar things like this at UCSF, but then there's other groups that kind of, again, looking at CTs to look at exactly where the electrode is located and then trying to remap the um, frequency allocation table based off of that to kind of make things line up perfectly well. Now, so there's a lot of advantages of that. There's potential disadvantages. The advantage of that is theoretically people can adapt more quickly, okay? And theoretically you should get a more natural sound. Um, the disadvantage of that, again, is sometimes to match up the frequency allocation table, or to do that, you have to strip out low frequency information, depending on where the electrode is located within the cochlea. And so you can make an argument that you're going to be better off letting somebody try for six months and see if you can get used to that. Yeah. Because we get used to that, you should get your best performance if you're getting as much speech information as possible. So the, again, this is where, you know, it's, it's a trade-off, you know, and, and I think what patients do, if you give them a chance to pick what they want, you know, they try to maximize intelligibility while getting the most natural sound possible. But there's a trade-off there. But you better believe people are absolutely looking at that, and that's kind of an, on, it's an ongoing debate within the field. Yeah. 
Are, is the limitation in terms of uh, the number of channels the, the electrical technology or the dissipation of the signal through uh, the latter? Issue? It's the latter. We could put 50, 100 channels in there, but it doesn't. But if, if Wi-Fi stimulate one channel and it, it stimulates the exact same set of nerves as another channel because of electrical spread of current, you get right. but, but, but you could presumably have certain um, materials that would have would minimize that, right? So things like graphene or... Pe people are working on that, but it's I, I can tell you that it's not there yet. And again, it, frankly, people are doing other things. Just saying, Some people are saying, like, look, let's just bypass the cochlea altogether. Again, cochlea, you got electricity and fluid filled medium. you got to crank it up to get past the modalis to the cell bodies on the other side. You know, there's um, groups out of Northwestern and otherwise that are experimenting with lasers directly onto the auditory nerve and using an optical stimulation of the auditory nerve. Because if you do that, you can get really precise, you know, in terms of what you're stimulating at that point. <clears throat> now, look, of course, you got to make sure the laser's not cooking the nerve if you do this on a consistent basis, you know. But, but when they do this with cats, cats can hear again with it. You know, it's, you know, I don't know what a, code, a speech coding strategy looks like for meows, but cats can hear again when you do this. <laughs> and we can record responses from the brain. But you're right. These are, these are areas, things other people are doing, for example, they're looking at... Um, um, can we regrow some of the dendrites? So if you put uh, neurotrophic stuff to try to uh, um, help the, the, the nerve fibers to regrow and connect, maybe that can help cut down the current spread realistically, which is one of the challenges we're into is because when the nerve fibers die off, you have to travel further to get to the spiral ganglion cellular bodies to make the, uh, the cell bodies fire or the, make the nerve fire itself. So you, you're, you're right. It's an ongoing issue, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah. Is there enough plasticity in the brain of someone young to tune the ears differently so that maybe one ear is for the lower half frequency range and the other ear is for the upper half and then you double the, the resolution. Yeah, that's that's a, a um, you know it's interesting. People have kind of looked at the short answer is probably not yet. It depends if you're looking at pre or post lingually deafened. But if you take your average post lingually deafened person, you know, it's like it's again you've got decades worth of representations of speech in your brain and it's really hard to, to learn, you know, kind of break that down from scratch. You take something that's never heard before, you know, theoretically it's possible. Now, I'll tell you, we kind of do this to some extent with, the, with these hybrid devices where we have the hearing aid in the same ear as the electrical stimulation, where the assumption is that the hearing aid can provide the very low frequency information and the electrical uh, component, you know, can provide the very, more of the high frequency stuff. And so we do certain things like this already, kind of within the same ear. Um, it's an ongoing debate as to how much people can integrate information like that across the two sides, though, you know. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it's, you probably are still better off. Um, I think you'd only do that if there's a real um, real reason otherwise. I can tell you that uh, Bruce Gantz has a handful of kids in Iowa that he took um, where bilateral, these are kids that were bilaterally implanted. One ear was implanted with a traditional full-length electrode. The other ear was implanted with the short 10-millimeter hybrid electrode, you know. And the assumption that they could try to preserve that ear for future regenerative technology at this point. And so um, they haven't published any data with those kids yet. You know, they say that they're doing well and that the kids can use the two devices together. But that's a massive mismatch across the two sides. And at least our data, like kind of, uh, we published a paper a few years ago in New York kind of showing that when you get a bilateral mismatch across two ears, people, if it gets too big, people just can't adapt to it. You know, and you got to do something different. <coughs> Is there a data from like from the vision literature? Because I guess that's a popular word to contact lenses with two different yeah. like, focal lengths and whatnot. But yeah, that, you know, it's like that it, help. You know. Yeah, it's it's a um, yeah. I still don't know that. Um, you know, the question would be like, why would we do one part to one side and one part to the other side? As opposed to just kind of maximizing the information going in each ear and creating that redundancy. Um, the other part, if you give one information to one ear and one bit of information to the other side, you also eliminate, frankly, all the cues to bilateral hearing that are so important, you know? So your ability to, you, would, you couldn't localize sound anymore. Right. And your ability to do these sorts of sound localizations is absolutely crucial for your ability to understand speech in the presence of background noise. So I, I just, you know, the, there'd have to be, I just, there's not a lot of good reasons to try that versus, you know, the other benefits that we can get from trying to get redundant information in each ear. Very good. Thanks, Thanks you, Max. Yeah.